Hi, welcome to session two of the social media crash course for government communicators. We're excited to have everyone here. We had a great session last week on social media policy. So let's go ahead and get started here. So first in terms of housekeeping, all attendees are on mute. Uh, feel free to use the question function that's on the right to submit questions. There will be a time for Q&A throughout the presentation. Um, and then also at the end, we'll also have some time for questions and answers. And finally, this webinar is being recorded and you will see, you will receive a copy via email. So let's go ahead and uh, jump into today's session, which is on best practices. Quick agenda. So we're going to talk very briefly about why we all love social media because um, in speaking to many of you, I know that your agencies are already very active on social media. Um, this wasn't necessarily the case uh, two, three years ago, so we'll briefly go through that. Um, then we're going to talk about, jump into the meat of the session today, which is four areas in which agencies are excelling with social media. And this is based on the conversations we have with over a thousand agencies around the country. And so as we look at what they're doing and we're talking to them, there's basically four buckets um, that we've seen that these fall into. And so we're excited to to share there. And most of that will be us showing you examples and, and you hearing uh, from people in their own words um, through videos and examples on the screen. And then finally, best practices for consistency. Um, this week we have a guest speaker who I'd like to introduce, Timothy Martin. So Timothy in 2016 was named the top social media advocate in government by GSM. Until recently, he headed up the Office of Citizen Engagement in Roanoke, Virginia. Uh, he just recently started a role, actually this week, as Senior Manager for Member Engagement at GFOA. And Timothy, the reason we wanted him to speak is Roanoke is a great example of a, a city that's just doing amazing things on social media. So as we have here on the screen, they have more than 60 accounts following of more than 200,000. If you look on the right, they publish a social media report each year, and this is from 2016. And so you can see 1.5 million video views, 2.9 million um, likes, comments, and shares, and a reach, total reach of 23 million. So great numbers. And uh, so Timothy's going to be jumping in in three different parts of today's presentation to talk about some specific things that they've done. Okay. So why we all love social media, and again, uh, let's get to uh, the next slide. So social media is where the audience is, and we're not going to talk too much about this because, again, you all know this already, but 79% um, of Internet users have a Facebook profile, with 76% of these using this site daily. 56% of adults use more than one social media platform, and that's you know, even higher when you start looking at the younger audience, of course. And then Instagram, massive uh, usage on Instagram. Twitter, or uh, YouTube, 4 billion daily video views. And we don't have anything on Twitter here, but again, we find that most agencies um, find that Twitter is, is just an invaluable tool with what they're doing. So what I'd like to do is just launch a quick poll here on where social media ranks in relative importance um, when communicating with your citizens. So I'll launch that poll there and just take a few sentence, uh, sorry, a few seconds to, to vote there. Okay, we'll take a few more seconds. We're at about 70% votes. Okay, so sharing results. So interesting. Now, this is an interesting question to ask. So 29% of the group said it's our go-to. 67% said the website is still primary. Social media is a close second. And only 5% say it's more of an afterthought or it's after that more of a bulletin board. And my guess is this group, there might be a little bit of self-selection. This might be biased a little bit toward the top two than if we did a, um, a broader industry poll. So anyway, just interesting to, uh, to see where the audience is in terms of their agencies. 
Okay, so four agencies in which, or four areas in which agencies are excelling in social media. So the first area is citizen engagement. And so the idea here is the foundation of any social media program really is citizen engagement. As we know, it's a powerful tool for building relationships with the community. Um, in particular, highlighting civic engagement on social media educates the citizen, educates your citizens about what your agency is, uh, is doing. So why it's important, and again, this is, is really a foundational thing I think most of you are doing already, but connecting with citizens online is a great way to figure out what's important to them and how to address them. Social media, as, as we saw from that last po poll, is either a primary or secondary tool for communicating out um, significant initiatives, programs, or events. And then the third thing, which is something Timothy's going to touch on here next, is first you need to have the audience. So part of the challenge with social media is it's a little bit chicken and egg. So you have to engage citizens to build your social media audience so then you can subsequently engage them more. So quick example here um, from Miami. This is a, a great example. I think they do this YouTube vlog. And I think they've done 30 or 40 of these at this point. And as they say here, it's a behind the scenes look into their work. And what, what it does is really humanizes the department. So the fellow that's pictured there on the screen uh, typically leads most of them. And, and they really give a, uh, a very in-depth and real look at what they do. So a lot of the, the, the vlogs are, um, are them out on patrol. And then they do some behind the thing, scenes things as well. So what I want to do is actually show a quick video here. I'm just going to show about 30 seconds of an example of it. Today, and we'll be patrolling the Philagami area that's in our South District. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Hi, I'm doing so wonderful. It's good to see you. It's great having you here with me today. You guys might know Asalasa from the Running Man Challenge. Hi, everyone. She had to do. She had to bring it to uh, Miami style, right? That's right. You had to represent. Miami style, you have to represent. Okay, so today uh, we're going to go hit the streets. That's right. Let's do it. So this is a, a totally different one. Okay? Yes. Uh, this is going to be part of what I do every day. Uh, the dancing, it's just a challenge. It's just a, a fun time. But this is actually what I do every day. Uh. Okay, great. And so, again, that's just a quick example. If you have a second to check it out, if you just go on YouTube, search under uh, Miami PD vlog, you'll see the whole series and uh, it's been great for them. And so as we have here on the screen, as we mentioned, um, in particular, it's really helped them reach a hard audience um, for a lot of municipalities to reach, which are males 16 to 24. It's increased recruiting. So one of the things they talk a lot about is, is just what's it like to be a, a police officer. And, uh, and as we say there at the bottom, it humanizes the police department. So great example. Now, um, you may say, hey, that, that takes a lot of work and a lot of resources, and, and it certainly does. They've invested a lot in that. Here's an example of something just more specific, less time-consuming, less costly. Uh, example of citizen engagement. This is Queen Creek, Arizona. Um, I guess as a lot of your agencies are doing something similar, promoting local events. So they've got a great picture here of the Peach Festival and um, basically five things to know uh, about the Peach Festival. So again, it's a balance of the big initiatives as well as the day-to-day -day smaller initiatives. Okay, so what I want to do is uh, hand the mic over to Timothy, and Timothy's going to talk about building a social media audience. So Timothy, let me, um, let me get your mic on here. Okay. Alrighty, well, uh, good to be with you today, and I uh, appreciate Archive Social uh, inviting to have me on. Um, this is really something that, um, when you look at Roanoke's success in social media um, and, and the large following that we've been able to gather, um, especially on the city's main Facebook page with more than 85,000 followers, it really all started um, back in 2014. Um, in February of 2014, I joined the city back in uh, 2013, in November of 2013, and um, one of the things that I realized um, when I joined the city was that we had a very engaged community. It's, the, the problem was the city just wasn't wasn't putting content out there to um, 
you know, to engage with, with residents like we should have been. And um, I was I was looking for a way or looking for the perfect time because I wanted, um, you know, the citizens to really play a key role in, in telling the story of their community because, you know, ultimately I wanted to build a, a large audience who we would have in place when we had when a major disaster happened or something like that, which we'll talk about examples of in a little bit. And ironically, um, in in February of 2014, that was kind of the moment that everything happened for uh, social media and and kind of sent everything, um, you know, the numbers um, skyrocketing, and, and really they haven't stopped since. Um, we had a massive snowstorm that that year um, in February, and basically it, it it was kind of over the weekend. Uh, Monday and Tuesday, um, pretty much everything was shut down. Everybody was, you know, trapped in their homes. They couldn't go anywhere. So, uh, you know, that Saturday, I used it as an opportunity to solicit snow photos from citizens um, and really wanted to kind of see how that went to potentially build something long term and in a relationship long term with our followers. And and the whole um, kind of the whole photo sharing um, of the snowstorm was about a four day period. And when I when I was done with that four day period, it was pretty overwhelming. Hundreds of photos were submitted from that snow event, um, and we ended up having a reach of those four days of 400,000 on Facebook. So it was certainly the biggest thing that the city's Facebook page had ever seen. Um, I think we got over a thousand new Facebook likes um, just during that four day span, um, and so. You know that was key for us moving forward. And while I thought it was going to be a lot more difficult to continue that, basically what that one event did for us was it put in the minds of people. You know, um, I can share things with the city. I can take pictures of, of Roanoke, of my locality, of, you know, pretty pictures of my hometown, and share them. And and my locality is going to put that out there. So while I thought that it was going to continue to be uh, you know, a building exercise of trying to get people to do this moving forward, it really became second nature for them from that one event because that event reached so many people on social media, so many people saw that others were sharing photos um, that, you know, as the snow melted, people started taking pictures of the snow melting and, and what the city looked like after the snowstorm. And then it just continued to spring is here, beautiful flowers over the city, beautiful scenery. Um, summer concerts in Elmwood Park, it became really second nature for citizens to take a picture, share it on their social media platform, and then send it to the city for us to share. And that really helped drive our social media success because those photos generated um, over the course of four years millions of likes, comments, and shares. And ultimately that helped increase our likes on Facebook by more than 60, 65, 70,000. Um, overall, which um, certainly helped when we had a major event that was growing. It's a great way to get people in, engaged in a conversation, um, and it's a great way to let people, which really was the ultimate goal, number one, build the base, but also let people um, tell their story of their city through photography, and photography does very well on social media with the algorithms. People love looking at, at, at photos. They love sharing photos. They love being able to say, "Hey, I took that, and look how many likes it's got." It, it got so you know it was almost a competition to, um, and you know it was just something that I think if that event had not happened, it would have been a, a much bigger challenge for us to get to where we are today. But I think we were able to capitalize on it, and we continued it. We posted user submitted photos every single day since. Um, there's not been a day that has gone by that we haven't posted a user submitted photo since that snowstorm happened in February of 2014. So, you know, it's uh, getting people involved, especially getting citizens involved in their community um, is a great way to build an audience because ultimately the bottom line is with local governments, you're there to, you know, you're there to inform and engage, but you're really there to inform and engage when there's, a, you know, when there's really important information to get out there and doing things like photo sharing and other things helps get you that audience. So, um, you know, hopefully you can, you know, if you haven't, if you haven't you know, done a photo sharing initiative yet on social media, maybe this will give you some, uh, give you some courage to do that. Okay, great. Thanks, Timothy. Great, uh, really specific, practical example there. And if you have any questions, if anyone has any questions, you can put them in the question box. And Timothy will be jumping on uh, two more times with some other specific ideas here. So thank you. Okay, so 
the first area was citizen engagement. The second area is crime and safety. So um, whether you're a municipality or particularly if we have folks from law enforcement that are, uh, or, or school districts that are on this webinar, basically using social media as a tool um, to keep residents informed about crimes and also um, specifically to solicit uh, crime tips or missing per information about missing persons. And it's amazing actually what's been going on in this space. There's an incident uh, I'm going to talk about in a second right around the woods from uh, where we are where they um, found an armed robbery suspect very, very quickly uh, just this last weekend um, through posting on Facebook. And as we talk to law enforcement organizations around the country, we're hearing that this is a critical use of, uh, of social media. So what I want to do is just play a, a quick uh, video from Andrew Green, Lieutenant Andrew Green from uh, Lima, Ohio, who is the PIO there and has a great story of how PDs are using social media, particularly Facebook. Solving crime. We've uh, captured several wanted persons, identified criminals, shoplifting, things like that, uh, tips. That's where it's been big for us. So, and most of our tips come in through private message, which I already talked about. That is why it's very important that um, we follow up on all of those private messages that come in, pay attention to them, respond to them, and let them know that they do have an avenue to reach us through private conversation and they can provide information to us that we do appreciate. I want to showcase uh, this crime right here. This is this was one that really set it off for us back in January of 2013. And this is where I really realized the power that social media had in uh, solving crime. And what this was is uh, these two guys in this photo went into a Speedway gas station and they committed a minor theft offense. They stole the donation jar for like uh, one of the charities off of the counter. The clerk never saw it, didn't know it happened until approximately an hour later they noticed it was missing, reviewed the video, and, and realized that they had the theft caught on tape. Officers went out there, and at that time, we handled it just like we had handled uh, multiple thefts prior to that, tried to have officers at the station identify. Uh, we were unsuccessful with that. I managed to get a hold of the video and put these still shots on our uh, social media platform. It was Facebook at the time. And within just a few minutes, we had both of those subjects identified by name, knew exactly who they were, how to find them so charges could be filed on them. It was at that moment that I really realized the power that we had at our fingertips with social media. Another case happened uh, just this year. It was the case of a, a missing child that had autism. Uh, we weren't notified about the missing child for over an hour after it happened. So the trail to find him was pretty cold at that point. We had officers out searching on foot. But based on these two social media posts that we put out, uh, they reached 84, 85,000 people in the, in the local area. And we were able to track him down based on a citizen who observed him walking on the railroad tracks earlier in the, in the morning saw the Facebook post later, and then said, hey, I remember that kid, came back, called, we were able to track him down. Um, turned out this child walked over 17 miles on the railroad tracks out of Lima. He was captured, uh, or not captured, he was found north of Bluffton, Ohio, 17 miles away, and reunited safely with his family. Okay, great. And so that's from a webinar uh, we did with Lieutenant Green a couple months ago. And uh, I, I think it's a really good example, again, of how PDs are using um, social media. One, one more quick example. This is the one I referenced earlier. Uh, I, put the, I added this into the deck actually yesterday. It just happened over the weekend. Uh, a local uh, police department um, used Facebook basically to capture an armed robber. So similar story. There was surveillance video. They posted it on Facebook. 
uh, the post received 44,000 views, bunch of shares, and as PDs will often say, they usually it comes from an anonymous tip. They got a post that led the police basically right to the suspect's house. Somebody um, basically gave them the address. And the uh, I'm not going to play the video here, but it's really interesting where the police chief basically said, um, talks about how, it, you know, it's changed the way, partially the way that they do law enforcement because, um, they, you know, a couple of years ago, they never would have been able to do this and to be able to to capture an armed robbery suspect um, in a couple of hours due to social media is amazing. Okay, um, and then finally, just a quick example, again, balancing the, the sort of the larger stories with the smaller stories. Here's an example, Dunwoody, Georgia, their PD does a great, a great job using um, social media. And so here's just a, a ex explaining a safety situation. So they, um, they said uh, in this post, they're talking about that they're posting someone um, with a vest on a particular crosswalk. What I like about it is they're explaining why they're doing that because a lot of times uh, cities and, and PDs will do things for a really good reason. As citizens, we don't understand why, and so they're using social media to explain. Okay, so third category, emergency management. So next week, we're going to do a whole session on crisis communication. And we're going to have some great examples from uh, people around the country on what they're doing with that. Um, but we do want to just touch briefly on emergency management. So as um, Timothy uh, started to, to talk about earlier, using social media to communicate in emergency situations, I think agencies are getting better and better at providing updates throughout the timeline, so before, during, and after. Um, also afterwards, doing internal review, um, incident response management, um, and seeing how they, how they did on social media in engaging their citizens. And as Timothy mentioned, often the emergency is actually a catalyst for building an awareness and growing your following. So the key is you want to make sure you're there during an emergency because people will be looking for you. Okay, and again, why it's important, I think it goes without saying that it's vital. Um, sometimes it's the only method of communication that reaches your audience, um, particularly the younger audiences. And it's also sometimes the easiest way for your audience to contact you, particularly if your phone lines get overwhelmed. Simple example here, uh, North Carolina Emergency Management Agency during Hurricane Matthew in 2016, they created an official incident has hashtag and they let people know this is the way that uh, we're going to communicate. And so it, it wasn't the only way, but it was a primary way and people could very quickly get up to date information. And again, as we say here, they used it throughout the timeline. So before, during, and after the crisis, what was nice is they had this set up right away. So it wasn't in the middle of the crisis, they were setting up the hashtag, but they set it up uh, beforehand or they, they were prepared for it. And so again, um, they, you, know, they, you can see it's fairly straightforward, but provided tons of updates throughout the uh, emergency. Okay, so let me uh, hand it back over to Timothy here and I'm going to uh, have him talk about something I think is really interesting around Facebook Live for emergencies. All righty, and just before I start, I want to mention I answered a few of the questions already in the, uh, in the question section, so you can check that out to folks that ask questions. Um, really, Facebook Live for emergencies, um, I think it's something very important that local governments should certainly consider if they're not doing it. I know, I know more and more local governments are starting to go live when there's when there's an event that happens in their city. And obviously Facebook Live hasn't been around for years. Um, it's just been around for, you know, two years now, I think, or a year, year and a half now. Um, but we started toying with this in the summer of 2016 um, is really when we, you know, Facebook Live became available for us. Um, and, and we really, you know, again, like the snow event, we were looking for that opportunity to use it for the first time. And we got that, um, during the event that happened, I think it was in July, it was an underground fire explosion um, that happened um, underground in downtown Roanoke. So you had smoke coming out of manholes, you had the you know, fire department closing off streets, you had everybody downtown, a majority of the buildings downtown had lost power. And there was a real um, threat that the power was going to be out for a very extended amount of time. So um, I immediately got to the scene and went live on Facebook immediately with our fire EMS chief who was um, kind of the, you know, 
kind of in control of the command central down there, and he gave a, a briefing on exactly what was happening. And then we went in and showed folks what was going on. And what, what, what's important about this, or what's kind of unique about this, is we were able to really showcase things that the you know traditional media wasn't able to because they were at a staging area and we were able to kind of go beyond the tape um, with the obviously the fire department's permission and, and and walk around the corner and when we got around the corner we were able to show that shot of smoke coming out of the pipes and what you know a specific pipe that crews were working on um, and anybody that does Facebook Live knows that when you've got a great video. Um, or you've got kind of the shot that you know everybody wants to see. You know that the shares pick up, everything picks up because that's that's kind of the shot, and that's what happened in this case, and that was crucial. And and when this event was over, one of the things is I kind of went back and looked, and, and what we did was we you know we also answered questions during the event. There were people in their buildings that um, didn't know if they were you know should they go home, were they okay, were they safe? You know it was kind of a an hour of people just kind of panicking for a little bit, um, not running out of buildings, screaming and hollering, but everybody was kind of like, what, what's going on? Um, so we were able to ease people's fears, um, but we were also able, um, you know, answer questions, but also to, to build that initial relationship for an emergency with people, to know that, um, hey, if something happened, um, maybe I should go to the city of Roanoke first before I, you know, before I check out, you know, the news Facebook page or, or something else. And when I, when I went back and looked at, you know, all the comments after this event was over, one of the ones that sticks out in my mind was somebody wrote, wow, nothing on our news. Um, we were able to get there first, go live first, get the facts across first without, you know, without any spin and tell people what was happening. And so that comment really stuck, stuck to my mind. Certainly we don't, you know, we're not trying to abandon the news media, but it's a prime opportunity for local governments to take control of their own message. Um, the next month we had a major flash flood happen in downtown Roanoke where it's almost like a river was running through downtown. And I got to the corner um, of one of the streets where the water was coming down and went live to alert people of what was happening. And at the time when that event was over, when that video was over, that was I think one of our most popular uh, videos at the time. And that four minute video um, that I shot live of that update before I moved down to another corner I had 200,000 views um, when I stopped um, and got back to the office, and so that was, you know, that was pretty incredible because breaking news obviously travels fast on social media. We all know that, but also, you know, that event taught us that there's a lot of people watching. There's there's local media watching and national media watching because um, that video ended up on the Weather Channel. They had contacted us via private message on Facebook asking to post that video on the Weather Channel. And then our one of our local CBS affiliates in, in town, WBBJ7, used our video from our Facebook page as the video for the lead-in to their um, 6 o'clock newscast. So, you know, when you've got a major event downtown, social media is where the media goes to see to get updates from, from local, local governments as well. So keep that in mind. Um, and then we had an underground gasoline leak at a gas station um, a few months later. I think it was October of that year. Um, we had to evacuate homes. And we went live every hour from the scene with the emergency management coordinator who was at the command central there, uh, giving updates with what was happening. We were able to answer questions from people wanting to know what neighborhoods were involved, what was impacted. And um, again, this was on a weekend. This event happened on a weekend. And we all know that news crews are, are kind of skeleton crews on the weekend. So this really gave us another opportunity to solidify that, you know, we were kind of the go-to place for major breaking news events. Now, you know, we're not going to cover a fender bender or something like that on our main city Facebook page, but we're, you know, we're going to cover the main breaking news. And um, I know that Twitter is the go-to place for a lot of breaking news when it happens for local governments. Uh, in Roanoke, our Facebook following was in the 80,000 range. Our Twitter following at the time was in the 9,000 range. So our motto has always been go where we've got the most people first. Um, and for us, it's been it's Facebook. And I know it, it varies from locality to locality, but that's why we um, that's why we're, we're doing Facebook. What I did in the event for the gasoline leak is I did Facebook Live update, and then I did a Periscope update immediately afterwards. Um, 
And again, this can be used for, you know, we all know, I mean, and then we've seen local governments use it uh, for more than just breaking news. I mean, anytime you've got something, go behind the scenes, as we've seen, um, press conferences, those types of things. You don't have, you know, the media is not going to be at every event you do as a local government. So this is your opportunity to be your own media, showcase to your followers what's happening. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a crucial opportunity for local governments that, you know, for folks that are not taking advantage of it, I think they're missing a key audience and missing a, a prime opportunity for engagement. Okay, thank you, Timothy. Sorry, we're having a problem with the audio there for a second. Um, I noticed there was a couple questions that came in regarding the uh, the photo sharing. So why don't we do this? There's three or four questions there. Let um, I'm going to quickly go through a couple more things, and then we'll have a Q and A, Timothy, in your last section here, where maybe after you go through your next section, you, we can then answer those questions around the photo sharing initiative. So okay, quickly going through our last section, just keeping an eye on time. So policy and politics. So again, pretty straightforward, using social networks to reach citizens with messages about policy and political issues. And um, we find that, that many agencies are doing this. There are a few that are, are really doing this exceptionally. The Why it's important, obviously, since many of your citizens, particularly the under audience, are already using social media, and these networks are a great way to reach them. And as your city's demographics change, again, with the younger audience, social media allows you to reach citizens who may not respond through the traditional media that, that municipalities have used over the last 10 years. Okay, so um, one interesting example, um, West Hollywood, California. Um, th this organization or, or this agency has done really interesting videos. You can go online if you search on YouTube under West Hollywood and you can check their different public service announcements. Um, as we say here, they have nearly 3 million views on YouTube. You can see on, on YouTube, you can see on the left, uh, if any of you watch Saturday Night Live, they have a spoof of the Californians called the Weehoans. Um, and uh, they have a whole series there that's pretty fun. Uh, some of their communication folks are involved with that. So they have some things that are more fun, as you can see in the center. They also have some more serious campaigns that they do. This is one of the better examples, I think, of an agency that is using video to really get across a, a broad variety of both really serious messages as well as just creating and, and reinforcing the culture of their community. So again, check that out. Uh, and, and again, balancing the larger initiatives with the more day-to-day -day initiatives on the other end of the spectrum, Flagstaff use, is just an example of using Facebook um, to inform citizens that they're going to have a public parking increase. So again, just explaining that, giving people advance notice. All right, so the four areas we talked about, citizen engagement, crime and safety, emergency management, policy and politics. Again, there's a lot more examples. There's probably things that, that a lot of people here are doing on the webinar that, that's really interesting. We just wanted to highlight a couple of these things to, uh, to basically create uh, curiosity and perhaps encourage people to, to try some new things. So I want to end with a, a quick section here on consistency. And uh, again, we're going to have Timothy jump on and offer his take on this. But building your audience takes time. It's really important to be consistent with your social media presence. So if you're really active for a month and then take two months off, um, what, what happens then is people don't know when you're going to be posting or engaging. And they tend to drop off in terms of engagement. Don't be afraid to respond to comments and answer questions from citizens. And again, balancing this with what we talked about last week with your social media policy, um, particularly around uh, moderating content. The, uh, you don't need to be on every social network. This is a big one. I, I think a lot of agencies that are particularly ones that have limited resources try to do too much. And so as we say here, just start with one or two and add more if you have the bandwidth to, to consistently engage on them. Um, developing a social media calendar. So, uh, and Timothy, maybe this is something you can talk to in a second, how you all did this. Um, to keep track of what you're posting each day, there's a variety of great tools to do that. Using a variety of media, I mean, that's essential, photo, uh, videos, live videos. 
and then preparing for potential crises beforehand. This is a central one. We'll talk about this next week, having a crisis communication plan. Okay, so again, I'm gonna um, pass this over to Timothy to, uh, to talk for a second here. Yeah, and, and, and you know, just to take a, a little bit of a deeper dive into policies, I think it's important from my experience um, that, you know, if you haven't, um, you know, look at your policy your organization has. Do you have a policy? If not, obviously, it's, it's time to create a policy. But I, I think, you know, it's not as, it's not as easy as saying, okay, let me go get, let me go get Roanoke's policy and let's match it. Um, I think, you know, one thing to keep in mind is, um, you know, every community and every city is different. Every county is different. Every, you know, you have a different audience. You have a different, you know, structure and organization. You know, the way we're set up in Roanoke in terms of how we manage social media may not be the same that it is for, you know, somebody in Sarasota, Florida, or, or whatnot, and that's okay. It's you know you don't have to don't have to match what everybody else is doing. You just need to you know figure out what's best for your locality. So looking at a broad broad range of policies from local governments is good because then that allows you um, to you know to pull something from this one and pull something from that one and kind of put and then add stuff of your own to put together you know, to put together the perfect policy. And I know Archive Social had a, a lot of great templates that, that you can pull you can pull policy information from. Um, you know, one of the things that we did was, you know, a best practices document for social media managers. Um, we had more than 20 social media managers in Roanoke managing all of the department pages while my office focused on managing the main city Facebook page. And certainly Google Docs is something good when you're creating a sharing document for uh, social media content calendars. I mean, that's one of the easiest things to set up um, and, and have everybody kind of get on board with that. Um, but, you know, just key things to look at in your policy. You know, it needs to fit your audience and your organization, as I said. Um, and, you know, topics to think about, administrator setup, who's going to have access, are they going to have training, how are they going to be monitored, um, you know, who's going to take them off when they don't work there anymore, those types of things. Page branding is very important. It was important for Roanoke. You know, every page had to have the city the city logo or the department logo. Um, posts that we use, graphics that we use, you know, need to ha needed to have a, a, a specific kind of brand to it. When we had a major snowstorm, we used, you know, the same branded, like, um, snow graphics for all of our different posts. Um, customer service. How how soon are social media managers expected to respond to citizens that, you know, send questions on social media? Um, in Roanoke, um, you know, we we stressed customer service on social media and recently um, before I left created an iRoanoke Twitter account which, you know, people could go and, and submit service requests and get responses back from our call center um, on potholes and different things, tweets right back to them, and, and the tweets, tweet alerts on when the problem was fixed and those types of things. The use of photography, comments from citizens. Um, you know, you should have a you should have a, a document in itself that talks about, um, you know, when you can uh, you know do something with a comment from from someone that may be inappropriate, um, because it's not as easy as just saying I don't like this post, uh, let's delete it. Uh, that's that's the wrong answer. So, um, and I know there's some great examples out there of, of of that, and that's something that your attorney's office should obviously um, play a hand in as well. The use of photography, um, getting permission to take photos and those types of things, getting permission from people to take photos, uh, crediting them for their photos. The use of live video. I mean, again, um, you know that wasn't around a couple of years ago, so it probably wasn't in a policy if you had it a couple of years ago, but it should be in there now. Kind of, um, you know, how do you handle shooting live video, and what what are the parameters? Um, how do you do contests? Having the contest rules, kind of a template of rules, allowable platforms, having an application for social media pages from departments, make them explain why they want to create pages, who's going to manage them, what kind of content are they going to have? Do they have content that can go on on a daily basis? Because if they can't, then that should be a red flag. So, I mean, those are some of the uh, things to think about as you're putting together a policy. But again, there's not a, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, and it's certainly, um, but, but you can pull so many resources from so many different local governments that have had experience with it to come up with the perfect, uh, the perfect policy for your locality. Okay, great, Timothy. I'm going to keep your mic on for a second. We had a bunch of questions, and let me just read a couple of these off for you to address. So back on the photo sharing, we had a question around what platform was the photo sharing on, and that was actually a couple questions there. And then 
do you engage and interact? How do you follow up and stay current with the photo sharing initiative? Right, so the platform that we used uh, for photos was very simple. It was send it privately to our Facebook page. Um, we don't allow citizens to post photos directly to our Facebook page. They have to send them to us privately. So we get to, you know, we're certainly seeing what photos are being sent. It also allows us to build a kind of back-end relationship with photographers um, or people, you know, amateur photographers or other, other folks that take photos because we then build that relationship with them and, and you have that customer service element. So somebody shares a photo, you engage with them on the back end about that photo. You also do some engagement when the photo is posted with other people that are commenting on it. And you're, you're ultimately building a, a relationship on the front end, but you're also building a, a deeper relationship on the back end because you're more likely to, you know, get many more photos from that person because you, you know, you've created such a positive experience from them. Um, and so that's something that, you know, it's not just kind of a thanks and move on. It's, it's, you know, continuing to have, I've even had, um, photographers that were really great photographers, um, you know, that, you know, would kind of go away for a month or two and I'd find their, you know, I'd look through the messages and I, and I, you know, I'd mark, you know, which, which photographers were really great photographers and I'd, you know, I'd send them a kind of a follow-up message. Hey, you know, I haven't seen anything from you lately. Um, you know, keep in mind, we'd love to share your photos and those types of things. So that kind of, you know, puts it back in their, in their, um, you know, in their mindset. So certainly, um, uh, certainly, you know, it's, it's, it's important to, um, you know, to create that engagement because it is, it, you know, it helps you out, but it also, you know, leaves a, a lasting impression on, on citizens in your community, which is really what it, what it's all about. We typically don't, um, you know, how are the photos shared again, private message. So there's no tagging of the photos. Um, somebody asked too about, um, ADA accessibility issues addressed when using Facebook live. I mean, you know, there can be a whole, you know, this is the, I think this is the growing topic um, in terms of local government social media and, and a, the, a growing challenge that local government social media managers are faced with is that ADA accessibility issue. Um, because, you know, what we do when we have a chance is we go back into the live video and we, we add the captions because, you know, Facebook kind of does it generically, which um, is many times wrong in terms of Facebook Live, but you know, you look at a situation that happened like, um, you know, that happened a couple months ago. We had a bear in a tree in downtown Roanoke, um, and I was out there Facebook Living that for an hour. Um, the amount of time what, for one person to go and then sit at their computer and try to caption all that out, an hour video is just overwhelming, and it's almost not possible. So I think there's got to be you know, there's got to be a lot of heads put together on this issue um, to try to address it. And, and I think, you know, I think local government certainly needs some help in that area because it's, it's a very, very big challenge. One other quick question, Timothy, on the photo sharing. How do you handle permissions for sharing um, photos, particularly if there are children in a photo? Right. So we get, you know, we, um, we have um, kind of a you know, paragraph on all of our social media pages that talks about what happens when you submit a photo and, and what it's used for. Um, and certainly if, if um, somebody submits a photo of, you know, their kid playing in the snow or something like that, then um, that's more of a deeper conversation of, you know, do we have permission to use, is this your child, those types of things. There's no, it all happens digitally and the messages are saved. Um, but for m many of the photos that we get, which are public event photos, um, that, you know, my, I may go out and take myself or somebody may, you know, may take, um, you know, from what we gather from, you know, our legal team is, you know, and, and I know a lot of local governments um, look at it this way that I've thought, you know, you're in a public space, so, you know, you should expect to have your photo taken. Um, you know, you look at Christmas parade, you look at parades and those types of things. Certainly you're not, and not everybody's handing out photos, signing waivers and those types of things when you're, you know, taking photos at parades. So, um, you know, if it's, it's, if it's more, you know, around your neighborhood, it's a little bit different than if it's in a public space. Um, and you can certainly, you know, post messages at public events saying you should expect to be photographed. Those photos may be used for social media and those types of things. Um, but not everybody that enters a public event, not everybody that enters an event for uh, a public space for an event is signing a waiver that says, hey, I can, I can have my photo taken. 
Okay, great. Thanks, Timothy. And that, that's interesting. The, the, uh, the question around photo content is something that as we do social trainings around the country, it comes up in almost every training session. So um, great to hear your thoughts on that. Okay, so I, just keeping an eye on time, I know we're uh, getting right to the end here, so I'm going to just quickly go through a couple of slides. So uh, as with last week, we're going to send you a follow-up email with some different resources. I saw we had a uh, fair number of people download di uh, different versions of the social media policy template, as well as the comment moderation guide, and also a lot of uh, watches of the webinar. So, uh, so that's great. So we'll send out another follow-up email. Quick reminder, next week we'll be on crisis communication management. Um, then we're going to skip a week, and then September 12th we'll wrap up, which is it, it, it's a session on social media record management, but it's really from the perspective of the communicators, not from the, the records group. And really it's around how do you protect your use of social media or avoiding social media lawsuits. And so we'll talk through where agencies are getting in trouble around the country and um, are either getting either with lawsuits or with fulfilling records requests. So we'll talk about that. And that'll actually be our CEO, Anil Chawla, who speaks a lot of events presenting that. Um, speaking of presenting, if you're going out to 3CMA in September, I know Timothy mentioned he's going to be presenting two sessions out there. So look for him there. And then Anil, our CEO, will also be presenting a session on uh, tweet deletes and uh, how president, uh, I think it's, I forget the exact title, something around presidential use and public official use of social media. So it should be an interesting session. Um, and then, so let me just open it up. Are there any further questions just before we wrap up today? And if so, you can put them in the, uh, the chat window or sorry, in the question window. Okay, it looks like we are good. Uh, I want to give a big thanks to Timothy Martin for joining us today. It's great to hear sort of real world stories and it, it contextualizes. So thank you, Timothy. Thank you everyone for joining and we will see you next week.